morning I want to talk to you about this concept, this biblical truth. Look to the stars. Look to the stars. Now, as I started 2020, I understood that this would probably be a year that included a very divisive and very partisan election. But it just got more complicated from there. First, we have a global pandemic and all that that's affected economically, physically. We're unsure of our work. We're unsure of, you know, if we go out and touch the wrong thing, we might contract the virus. But it wasn't just that. This virus brought out a lot of complications. It exposed uh, a lot of fault lines in our culture. For example, just how essential is a church? Just this last week, it became clear that casinos could open while churches could not. And the pastor of the Church of the Highlands lost the major lease in public schools because he liked tweets from a controversial conservative figure. And then on top of all of this, all of the angst, we have the death of Ahmed Arbery, Brona Taylor, and George Floyd, the resulting protests and then riots. And even just over the last day, with the killing of Rashard Brooks in Atlanta after he scuffled with police and took a stun gun before being killed. Also, we have the formation of the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. So I don't know about you, national debt, economic crises, religious freedom under attack, uncertainty about the future. And all of this have been called to try to provide some clarity and to speak into it. We've done the best that we can. I encourage you to look at the podcast, the website. I had a great conversation with a black pastor named Andy Hunt. And just this last week, we put out a biblical roadmap for engaging racial injustice. But I'll just tell you that my heart, if I could use a biblical term, is troubled. Troubled. You see, we have this kind of narrative in our culture that we are enough. That if we would just implement progressive ideologies, that our worst habits would go away. That everything would be up and to the right. Economically, culturally, racially, politically. We would kind of find ourselves in the broad Sudland uplands, as Churchill would say. That's not 2020. But just in my own heart, I find myself troubled, wondering, what's next? Where do we go from here? And one of my colleagues who works in Minneapolis, he shared with me, I think, last week that he's in the midst of all of these meetings, but he told me, Josh and the rest of our group, I've dedicated to spending an extra hour in the morning in God's Word, and an extra hour at noon in God's Word, because I don't have the answers, I don't know what's going on, and I need to talk to the one who does. And so this week, I turned my attention back to Isaiah chapter number 40, a very common passage, and these are, there are truths in this passage that I wanted to bring out and share with you this morning. Now, in the midst of all of this, you probably saw the fact that SpaceX and NASA joined, to, joined together sent astronauts up for the first time in about a decade. We've been using other nations' spacecraft since about 2011. It's been almost 60 years since we launched into space, about 51 since we landed on the moon. And if you listen to me for any time, you know that I love sci-fi. I'm fascinated by space exploration. Uh, we talked before about the mission where they're about to land on the moon, and they're in this spacecraft. And I'm just thinking about how often like my iPhone messes up and crashes, or my computer crashes. Well, all of a sudden, their spacecraft flashes Error 1202. Well, what was significant about Error 1202 is they had never experienced that error before. And they're like upside down about to land on the moon and their computer spits out an error. And you can hear Neil Armstrong on the radio. Now, if it was me, it would be like, Error 1202, we're all gonna die. And he just says, Error 1202, and they fix it. All right, so the fascinating stories about exploring the stars. And I thought for just a moment, in all of this, that we kind of took a sigh, and looked up. And I th there's something there. There's something that brought us together. It was NASA's most watched um, broadcast of a launch. And I was thinking there's lots of, of great memes and humor kind of around this. Um, I did see this one. Congratulations to the astronauts who left Earth today. Good choice, all right? Good choice. We're out of here, man. We're going to the space station. You guys can deal with it. But there was something about the fact that in the midst of all of this struggle and crisis and problems that do need to be addressed, the kind of we as Americans looked up for a moment and it brought us together and provided some unity. And I thought, you know, I've read that, that, that somewhere before and, and God brought me back to this passage. 
So there are four things that I want to share with you today from this passage. Let's jump right in. The first one is the moment. The moment. Chapter number 40 of Isaiah is Isaiah speaking through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the people of Israel. Remember that Isaiah was an Old Testament prophet. He was called by God to speak to Judah, to warn them, if you do not turn, then judgment will come. And that's kind of hard for us to hear these days, but it's simple. It's just that if you follow God's principles, you will be blessed. And if you don't, you won't. And that was Isaiah's general message. He spoke faithfully. And at one point, he was killed by King Manasseh. Not trying to be too graphic this morning, but a Jewish tradition says that he was actually sawn in two. And if you remember that phrase from Hebrews 11, where it says that they were sawn asunder, that's probably a reference to the prophet Isaiah. So he lives in this moment right at the very end of Israel's existence. And Israel was in the Promised Land for almost 900 years. And you can imagine, he must have been a proud Jew, right? He was part of God's chosen people. They'd been there for 900 years. That makes the United States look like an adolescent or a young adult. They had been in this place, but now the Northern Kingdom had already been destroyed. And now there are enemies coming against Judah. What's fascinating to me, if you look back at Isaiah chapter number 38, just to set the stage, in Isaiah 38, the Assyrians come and attack Jerusalem, the capital of Judah, an army almost 200,000 strong. And if you remember the story in, verse, in chapter 38, the agent of Sennacherib comes to the gates and says, your God will not protect you, we'll destroy you like everyone else. But what happens? Hezekiah goes to God and prays for deliverance. And the angel of the Lord, not the Jewish army, but the angel of the Lord comes and kills 185,000 Assyrians and delivers Jerusalem. Wow. And so you might be thinking, Isaiah said, well, you know, I'm supposed to prophesy that there'll be destruction, but God's protected us. But then Hezekiah gets sick. God grants him an extra 15 years. But what does he do during those 15 years? He invites an agent of the king of Babylon, a rising power in the Middle East at the time. And he shows him all of the beauty of Jerusalem and all of the wealth in the temple. And Isaiah, to use the term we might use now, flips out. Like, why did you just do that? Why did you just show the Babylonians all the treasure in the temple? What do you think they're going to do? They're going to bring their army and come back and try to conquer us. In verse number 6 of Isaiah 39, if you want to look with me, God tells Isaiah, go to King Hezekiah, and this is what I want you to tell him. He says, behold, the days come that all that is in thine house, all which your fathers have laid up in store to this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. So can you imagine being Isaiah? I'm sure you loved your country, you loved your king. And he has to tell them, our land's going to be destroyed. Now, I try to translate this to us as Americans, because it's easy to kind of look at the, the Israelites back then. Yeah, their, their, army got, or their land got destroyed. There's a, a really powerful moment in an Amazon original series called The Man in the High Castle. Um, love history, and it's this historical what if. What if the Nazis and the Japanese won World War II? Basically, so the Nazis got the A-bomb first. Uh, the story is just rich. Like John Wayne in this, this history dies riding a tank while trying to defend Cincinnati. There's just all this really great stuff in there. But the Nazis in this, in this historical fiction want to celebrate their global ascendancy. So they declare Yarnul, the year one, and they blow up the Statue of Liberty. Now, like, I didn't expect it to affect me this way, but they blow up the Statue of Liberty and the torch goes flipping across New York Harbor and then slowly sinks into the water. And Himmler, who follows Hitler in this fiction, says, at long last, her light goes out. And this was a really visceral emotional reaction to this, this portrayal. But this is basically what Isaiah is prophesying. Isaiah, that Israel is going to be destroyed. That's the context. That's the moment as we come into chapter number 40. And so we start in verse 1. Comfort ye, comfort ye, says, my, my people says your God. This word comfort doesn't just mean like consolation. Like here, let's just wipe your eye. Uh, we want you to be comforted. No, it also means repentance. And so Isaiah is saying to the people of Israel, comfort you, comfort you, my people, says your God. You need to repent so you will be comforted. So that's number one. 
understand the moment, the context in which this is to be given, it's not all that different from our own. In fact, it was worse. Isaiah is saying, we're going to be destroyed, but here's God's response. So number two, the Almighty. So you might think that God would, would bring to Isaiah's attention this long list of sins that they should correct, these action steps that they should do, some strategy for saving Israel. But what does God do? Look in verse number nine. At the end it says, Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand. His arms shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. In the first part of this chapter, I encourage you to read the whole chapter for yourself. There's a, a foretelling of John the Baptist who's going to prophesy the way of the Messiah. It says in verse 11, He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms, carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. And so it starts out with the description of God Almighty, who's tender, who's like a shepherd. But don't mistake who he is. And this next passage reflects Job chapter number 38 with a list of questions, with an answer of no one but God. All right, the first one's in verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollows of his hand? Okay, wow. Well, you know, that's, and it's easy for us, like we're ready to get to lunch and all right, this is good, but oh, hold on. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Just the little hollow of your palm. We know that the ocean is 36,200 feet, feet deep in its deep, deepest part. And the ocean probably contains something like 36 million trillion gallons, 70% of our Earth's surface. He holds that, the palm of his hand. Wow. And then what does it say? It says, and meted out heaven with a span. Measured heaven with a span. A span is an ancient measurement from the thumb to the end of your pinky finger. So a span is like half a cubit. We know from science that there are 100 billion galaxies, and we expect that we'll discover 100 billion more as our technology increases. That's galaxies, not stars. He measured that with his spade. He goes on to say, and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in balance. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor has taught him? With whom took he counsel, and whom instructed him, and taught him in the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of the understanding. And so us as these we're very advanced humans with incredible technology, God said, who taught me? No one. And so as God is responding to Isaiah, in a moment kind of similar to our own, where a lot of the things that we trusted and we expected and we wanted have been broken down, have been changed, and been transformed. God's response was, look to the Almighty. Remember how powerful I am. Remember that I'm omniscient, I know all things, I'm omnipresent, I'm everywhere, and I'm eternal, I'm everlasting. The next thing that he points out is the minute, the minute. If you look in verse number 15, behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket, and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. Now, we as Americans, again, this is kind of a hard concept for us. We expect that our democracy, our great republic, will last a thousand years. Just like Rome, just like many nations throughout history have prophesied that will last forever. But God says the nations are like a drop of a bucket. <coughs> There's a great church father named Augustine of Hippo. Some people know him as St. Augustine. He lived at the very end of the Roman Empire. In a very similar moment to our own, Rome was sacked by a barbarian tribe called the Visigoths. Now at that time, Rome wasn't much of much strategic importance, but it was everything and emotional significance to the people of that time, including Christians. Because the Roman Empire, quote unquote, converted to Christianity, well, the Visigoths burned the place. And even church officials lamented, they mourned. This was like the end of an age. They didn't know what was gonna happen next. And Augustine wrote a profound volume of, of books called The City of God. And he pointed Christians in that moment to eternity. And said, Rome, as great as it was, was nothing in comparison to eternity. It was insignificant. Just as God says that a nation's like a drop, a little drop of water in a big bucket. Yes, it's important and we should value our citizenship, but we have to keep God's perspective on eternity. 
And Augustine's work is still studied today. So he talked about nation. Okay, we accept that. But now look with me in verse number 22. It says, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, meaning God. And the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. All right, so I don't know if you were in the habit of saying something aspirational or inspirational to yourself at the beginning of the day. I'm great. I'm a conqueror. I'm a, I'm a champion. I'm going to go out and I'm going to accomplish everything. And then you read this verse and say, like, you're a grasshopper. <laughs> now, grasshoppers are cool. I mean, they can jump pretty high. I wouldn't say they're exactly cute. Um, you can catch fists with them. But, I mean, they're just these insignificant little things. And that's what God calls us in comparison to him. It says, it stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in that bringeth the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth. He shall blow upon them, and they shall wither, and the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. I was thinking about this as I'm, I'm writing a resource on citizenship. According to scholars, Paul was probably killed. The, the Apostle Paul was probably killed in Rome, beheaded. And as he talks about He's finished his course. He's kept the faith. And he talks about the eternal kingdom. You have to understand, Paul's sitting there. All right, he was just condemned to die by a God king who thought he was part man and part God. And he's sitting in this magnificent crown jewel of the Roman Empire. And for them, that was the world. And here he is as he rests his neck on a block or however they killed him. He looks around him at the pomp and majesty and glory of ancient Rome. And he writes to Timothy about another kingdom. Now, Rome's dust. Colosseum's a spectacle. We think and write about the Roman Empire, but it's a chapter in a history book. This is what God is telling Isaiah. This is what he's telling the Jews. And so he says, I'm the Almighty, and you're minute. Both you and your institutions and your nations, they're minute. Now again, don't hear me to say that our country is unimportant. It's very important, and we should be good citizens. But the, the problem is, to be able to help, to be able to make a gospel-centered difference in our times, you can't think like everyone else. You have to think according to the principles in this book. And this is what God is telling us for you to be effective and to be centered in yourself so you can go help others. You need to understand the Almighty. And then you need to understand your place. And then here's the last part of this. I love this quote. It says, I will love the light, for it shows me the way. Yet I will love the darkness, for it shows me the stars. Mm -hmm. All right? Ogmandino is an author. So in this way, we have a view of the Almighty. And we have a view of ourselves. And so it's important for us as Christians, we would never have wished these events on anyone, but they're here. And it points out some of our hypocrisy, some of the facades that we put up, that we're enough, that we've solved our problems, our original sin of not treating all people as created in the image of God. And so we talked about the minute. And lastly, I want to talk about the message. If you would look with me in verse number 26, or verse 25, it says, To whom then you liken me, or shall I be equal, says the Holy One. <laughs> what a powerful verse. I mean, here's the God of the universe saying, who is equal to me? Who will you liken to me? And we in American culture have said, oh, I know. I have an answer. Me. I'm equal to God. In fact, I know better than him. How is it working out for us? And so as God is telling us these things, he says, do you know who I am? Who is equal to me? No one. And then verse number 26, he says, Lift up your eyes on high, and behold who has created these things, and bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. Look at that first phrase. Lift up your eyes on high. What is he saying? Say it differently. Look to the stars. Look to the stars and look to the one who created the stars and that controls all things. He first goes on in verse 27. 
Why says thou, O Jacob, and speaketh, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God, and my rights are my position? He's saying, why are you, Israel, saying that you've been neglected, that you've been overlooked? You haven't been. I'm here. I'm with you. I'm present. Verse number 28, I love this verse. Hast thou not known, not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is he weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. We're about to come into these very well-known verses. It says, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. How many times have you read that verse? Have you considered its truths? But now as you see it in context, now, maybe you've done that before, but just for me this week, as I'm bringing these truths, that it's this critical moment in Judah's life, that God points us to the power of the Almighty, just how small we are, and then he says, what's the answer? What's the message for you today? It is to trust me. It is to be confident in me because I know everything, because I'm eternal, because I'm all powerful. You trust me. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. So ever since um, Josh has been back from college, we've been trying to work out together. Um, and Josh, he's very strange in that he loves leg day. Like, who loves leg day? All right, leg day, if, if you're unfamiliar, is like doing squats um, and working out your legs. Like nobody wants to see your legs, right? So it's that. And then number two, it hurts. It really hurts. Like squats, you're going all the way down and then coming back up with as much weight as possible. So I like, you know, let's do arms. Josh's like, no, leg day. What's wrong with you? All right, and then my version of cardio is let me listen to a podcast. We're running at a very you know, sustained clip. That's good. That's informing the soul and helping the body. Now, I think Josh has this like evil layer under his house where he contrives these torturous things like involving ropes and boxes and all this stuff. So Josh is a youth, but every once in a while he gets weary. I'm just not sure when. Um, the, the, the men shall, young men shall utterly fall. And so we get that especially if, if we've been on the earth a little longer. You're not tired. And I don't know if you've experienced that over the last couple of months. It's, I'm tired, I'm weary. Not just my body, but my soul. I, I'm weary of how people treat each other on social media. The things that are going on in our country, the division. Where do we go from here? Well, the message for us from this passage, look to the stars. See the God who created us Amen. and find strength and find rest in him. I was thinking a little bit about Elon Musk this, this last week. Now, I don't hold Elon Musk up as a, a moral paragon or moral example, okay? I probably know some of his story. I was recently thinking about the fact that he, he named his, his kid um, X-12, but he and his, and his girlfriend actually had different names for their kid. I mean, this is just so Elon Musk, okay? <laughs> uh, but if you haven't read about his life, this is a great work by Ashley Vance. Um, it's fascinating, in the early days of SpaceX, he made a lot of money with PayPal. He, almost, he invested almost all of it back into Tesla and into SpaceX. But as they were trying to launch their first rocket, and I mean, every rocket is a massive investment. And so they're out on an island in the Pacific and they, they're all ready to send their first rocket it goes up and blows up or falls in the water. All right, pretty much I'd be like, you know what? I think a yacht in the Caribbean's good, you know? Uh, yeah, I got all this money in the bank, you know, let somebody else build the rockets, but not, not Elon Musk. So they get down to the very last launch. And see, the thing is, you're not just blowing up your own rocket. You're also, you know, you're having leases or, or contracts with multi-billion dollar, multi-billion dollar players to send up their communication satellites. So it's not just your rocket that goes in the drink, it's their satellite too. And so you talk about pressure. So they're down to like the last launch. If this rocket doesn't work, they're done. Well, they have to fly it out there. And because of the pressure difference, 
from on the ground and in the air, the engineers are looking into the cargo hole and they see the metal and the rocket kind of doing this number, right, crinking in. And so then they have to decide, should we send it up? Should we not send it up? If I have a launch date, we gotta get up here. So can you imagine? This is Elon Musk's fortune. Like sitting on the pad, everybody's uh, biting the nails. Finally, the rocket launches, but it goes straight into outer space. And the rest is history. So it's one of those grand American stories by a, a very wonderfully modern, eccentric individual. But part of this, the lesson was just his, his determination to go to Mars. He wants to see us back into the space race. And so you're gonna see his story. I also was thinking about Gus Grissom, who is our Hoosier astronaut. And if you've been to Springdale State Park, you've seen his little memorial or museum there. I love this quote, we were there last weekend. It says, if we die, this is Gus saying, if we die, we want people to accept it. We are in a risky business. We hope that if anything happens to us, it will not delay the program. The conquest of space is worth the risk of life. And if you followed his story, you know that he was one of three astronauts who died in a flash fire in a capsule at the very beginning of the Apollo program. I, I say all of that to, to say this. When I say look to the stars, I think it's important for us as a society, it's helpful for us to kind of look together towards something beyond this little troubled sphere. One little drop in a massive galaxy filled with perhaps 200 billion galaxies. But as I think of astronauts like Gus Grissom, who risk his life to go into the unknown, how much more should we be willing to do, to think, to risk, to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to those that need it in our country, and to live it out every day, everywhere. Amen. So as I told you, my heart is troubled. I imagine, even if you might not admit it to someone else, you're probably troubled as well. Or maybe you should be. <laughs> if you kind of put your head in the sand and say, ah, oh, this doesn't bother me. You could be like Hezekiah, who said, for there, there shall be peace and truth in my days. He's like, oh, well, we'll be conquered, but you guys will have peace and truth in, your, in my days, so we're fine. No, we should deeply care about the problems in our society, the problems in our city. So what are we going to do about it? Well, I think first we have to come back and have a biblical perspective. I always try to kind of bring in what I say into one thought and, and try to say it in a way that perhaps can help you, will help you remember. But today I don't have anything better than simply what Scripture says in Isaiah chapter number 40, and that is, look to the stars. In a time when we don't know what's going to happen, there is only one person that we can trust, and that is a God who is omniscient, who is omnipresent, and who is eternal, yeah. and who cares for you. Right. So this Sunday, I just wanted to bring this encouragement to you. Not my words, but the words written to Prophet Isaiah in a critical moment in Judean history. And I pray that we apply the same thing to our lives. So in 2020, I encourage you to look to the stars.